Hello and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal humans and we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Benjamin D. Campos, a designer and believer, and Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Hello, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. Of course, it's good evening for Jeff because he's in London, where he's eight hours ahead of me in Southern California. We choose a topic of interest, spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, then we publish the notes, which are available on the site to read along. Eclecticist.co.uk Spelling-wise, just Google it. Why we do this? The main benefits are the fostering of a greater understanding of the world before we die and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing on today's show is comedy. Apparently there are only four jokes, or five, or some other low number. Depends on who you ask. The point is that all jokes are derivative of only four actual jokes, or five, or some other lower number. Despite this, comedy as an art form is forever popular. People like to laugh, whether it's a silly joke, a clever joke, some spiky piece of satire, gallows humor, comedy can be remarkably useful. As crazy as it sounds, in one form or another, it could have been humor that helped us deal with 9-11, and it could even help us with the healing of the recent Paris attacks. Comedy is also extraordinarily subjective and often a fairly reliable barometer of whether someone is a decent bloke, like sits always sunny in Philadelphia, or a total moron, like two pints of lager and a packet of crisps, please. But what of the people who create comedy, and do they all have mental problems? Now, we're certainly not going to speak about homeopathy in this particular episode. Um, comedy is a very large subject, obviously, and it's hugely subjective, which is always entertaining. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of research into the history of comedy, but I, in fact, didn't get any time to do that. And the only thing I could think of is, are jesters. But I did do some reading around the psychology of laughter. So, as we know, everybody likes laughing. I believe that's universal. I think uh, perhaps some of the jihadis in um, ISIS or um, Daesh, as they are now referred to, I think they don't like laughing, maybe. They're the only exception uh, in the human population. But uh, apart from that, everybody likes to laugh. So I wanted to know why we laugh. What, what is the point? Because when you hear people laughing... It's, it's a weird sound. I mean, it's really odd, and it varies quite a lot. You get a sort of Eddie Murphy-style laughter, and then you get a kind of Michael McIntyre-type laughter, and you get everything in between, and they are at the extremes. Um, it's a very peculiar sound, and it's a familiar sound wherever you go. It, you know, it, it obviously bridges all language barriers, the actual sound. Um, why does it happen? So in my reading, um, I read a paper... Um, by a linguist, Deborah Tannen, and this is from ages ago, like 30, well, from 1991, it's from a book, You Just Don't Understand. And they did a study <coughs> on, on who laughs, uh, gender-wise, in various groups. But more interesting, I thought, is the evolutionary biological reasoning behind doing it. So an example is chimpanzees. Chimpanzees spend an enormous amount of time grooming each other, which is a sort of a one-on-one -on -one or at most one-on-two sort of effort. And the reason why they do this is for social bonding. Social bonding is incredibly important in order to create inclusion groups. So chimpanzees, by spending so much time on, one -to -one, on a one-to-one -one basis, grooming, affords chimpanzee dumb to create fairly small groups of chimpanzees. So their societies do not grow beyond very small groups. In steps, language. Language is a much more powerful and broadly appealing social inclusion technique. You are able to speak to many people at once, for instance, or you are able to communicate ideas to multiple people in sequence. So you have a, a, a larger... Um, field 
of enterprise when it comes to language. So you can create larger civilizations. And this has worked well for humans. We can create very large civilizations indeed, include, you know, pan-earth civilizations through language. And then laughter comes along as well. And that it, it, that doesn't require language. You know, la laughter will allow you to create those social bonds over and above language. So it's another incredibly useful tool to uh, bind us together and create larger groups. We couldn't survive in civilizations if we didn't have these bonds, and bonds are created through language and laughter in the human species. This is what I uh, found with great interest in this book by Deborah Tannen. That was my research into laughter. I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> Because it, it is odd. It's just so queer when you hear people laughing. When you really think about it, it's just, wow, what a crazy, crazy sound you're making come out of your face. Well, there are interesting sort of evolutionary stories and uh, conjectures behind a lot of crazy things we do. Like yawning, for example, is, a, is an interesting one. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that there's some crazy little factoid attached to uh, laughter. But one thing's for certain. Most people, apart from ISIS, like to laugh. It's true. They do. And I think... Um, again, from this study, this book, uh, You Just Don't Understand, from 1991 by Deborah Tannen, um, she ran case studies on you know, over a thousand uh, people, and she found that women laugh more when, there is, uh, when, when you have um, couples. So if you have a, a man and a woman, the man will make more of an effort to be funny, and the woman laughs more. And this was a significant finding. You know, it was statistically significant that this was the case throughout all the case studies. It really does seem as though the men are trying to make the women laugh. Um, and that just seems like a fact. So again, you know, you can speculate on why that is. And in evolutionary terms, you know, maybe it's the, the peacock syndrome and that uh, it's the men who need to attract the women because the women just innately are attractive to the men. They're sort of like the target. Yes. So, you know, they're the ones who have the the selection. I mean, that that doesn't sound like rocket science to me. I think everyone probably um, has uh, witnessed that phenomena of uh, the guy being funny, you know, as you've written here in the notes. Um, yeah, I think you're, are you being sexist? Uh... Are you saying women aren't funny? Is that, that what you are sexist? saying? I guess you could probably say that's being sexist. Um, but again, it's that, it's that fine line of um, whether or not it's ethical to pursue a line of inquiry, you know, even if the facts may be on your side. And uh, it just, you know, by talking about maybe factually, <laughs> statistically speaking, that women aren't funny might be stepping over a line. It might be one of the things that you don't do. As you'll probably talk about, Christopher Hitchens, you know, had this uh, controversial um, op-ed that he wrote. Actually, I don't know what he wrote it, wrote it for, but uh, he made this observation that women aren't funny, which is such a kind of crazy headline. Um, it's like, well, what, what are you talking about? But he explains it very eloquently that, you know, it's the guy that'll make the jokes. It's the woman that, that'll laugh at them. No, I just think it's fascinating. I, I mean, in my personal experience is that men certainly try to be funny and, and the women are laughing at their jokes and if their jokes are any good. But uh, I don't. my personal experience of life is that I think the funniest people I've experienced are always men. Right. I think there are funny women. I, I know some, some funny women. Uh, I, I don't. I, I absolutely wouldn't say that there are no, no funny woman, women. Ob obviously there are, but as far as a trend is concerned, I would say there are far more funny men than there are women. And I don't think it's because women don't have the access or are somehow discriminated against. No, I don't think it's any of that. But like a lot of people, when I first heard, you know, Hitchens is headline, you know, women aren't funny. I was like, well, that's not true. I, I know, you know, three women off the top of my head, friends of mine say who, who are funny women. But then when he explained it, it was like, oh, yeah, I, I see what you mean. And sure enough, you know, if I'm trying to woo a lady, um, yeah, I'll try and make her laugh. You know, I'll try and be funny. You know, that, that's always, you know, a very re recognizable um, situation for any guy. There is a considerable cultural variation in what is funny, I believe. I think different groups of people, different culturally, culturally different groups of people find different things funny. That is to say, 
if you were to learn a foreign language and travel to the country where that language is spoken primarily and tried to crack some jokes, I think those jokes may very well be lost on the incumbent population. There is a cultural bias, and to be really truly funny, I think you play on cultural themes that are funny to that specific culture. So I think it's difficult to be universally funny. To be truly what? To be truly funny, you need to play on cultural themes. You need to be savvy when it comes to the culture you are performing to. Um, I think there is types of comedy that can penetrate that barrier, and this includes slapstick comedy. I mean, visual comedy can be funny, funny universally. So, you know, I'm thinking Benny Hill, uh, Mr. Bean, um, who was that chap who, who hung from clock faces? Harold Lloyd. Harold Lloyd, Harold Lloyd, uh, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, those sorts who, you know, performed and perfected extremely visual comedy. No language is required. No real cultural perspicacity is needed. Uh, it's just funny on a visual. And perhaps either you, you love it or you hate it. But I think you're more likely to strike gold if you have a culture penetrating comedy idea. And I think local comedians always appear to be funnier than foreign comedians, for instance. I can't remember the last time I laughed at a Belgian stand-up comedian. I just, I just don't recollect. Perhaps I have, but uh, I don't recall. I remember laughing at a Swedish comedian, which was odd. And um, the chap commented, you know, he, he prefaced his performance with the fact that nobody's going to laugh because he's from Sweden, which was funny. <laughs> and then he continued to be funny. And I thought, well, there, there you go. But then perhaps the Swedish... Perhaps Sweden is closer to us culturally um, than we think. Or perhaps Swedish cultural mavens are more in tuned and more informed and inspired by a Western culture. So I'm thinking of the United States and, you know, primarily English speaking countries. Uh, they influence the rest of the world. So the rest of the world can develop an appetite for the products offered from the American and British comedy scene, I reckon. I certainly think America and the UK are leaders in, in comedy, certainly stand-up comedy. Is that controversial? Uh, no, I don't think that's controversial. I think that's coming from your perspective of being a British man. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are someone from yeah, Germany. Yeah, I think a Bangladeshi think might, might well think differently. Uh, I agree. Well, that's my point. So. Yes, and you know, let's not forget all the stereotypes. You know, For example, um, Germans who uh, think that the British sense of humor is just obsessed with toilet jokes <laughs> which is probably so true funny and the germans are humorless they have no humor right uh there have been um german comedians uh but they are unwittingly so which just made it funnier there's a german guy that they use quite a lot on uh radio 4 panel programs panel comedy games whatever that genre is called what's his name is there i wasn't aware there's a German on, on. It wouldn't surprise me that there's a German on, uh, on BBC comedy. Uh, Henning Venn, um, who's on all of the, you know, the news quiz, and uh, he's on um, the nine out of ten cats or whatever. He's German. He has a German accent and all of that thing. But he must have spent a, enough time here in the UK to be able to sort of get a get a handle on the sort of the kind of cultural. He's been um, anglicized. Yes. Anyway. But yeah, it is. Um, I, I think also to stick to stereotype again. I think English, the English are very sort of snobby when it comes to comedy. I think there are probably more comedy snobs in the UK than anywhere else in the world. What would a comedy snob look like? A comedy snob will tell a room of people that what they just all found funny wasn't funny. <laughs> That's funny. I'd say the first name that springs to mind is a chap called Stuart Lee, who's um a real sort of a comedy connoisseur and the people who take stand-up very seriously hold him in very high regard and one of the little skits that he had was making fun of um a sketch from uh only fools and horses that won like the best sketch award of you know <laughs> the last hundred years and it was the one where um del boy went to lean on the bar when he's with trigger and someone opens up the bar. This is a bar, like in a nightclub or something. And opens up the bar, and then Dell just falls straight to the floor. 
that that was the that was the only funny scene in the entire 10 series of that program and it was pure pure slapstick uh it actually wasn't funny jeff I thought it was, well, I thought it was, I tittered. It's one of those things. I mean, I can recognize, I, I understand when I see something that I can imagine people laughing at, or if people do laugh at something in particular, I can understand why they did, whether or not I think it's actually funny. And other scenes or jokes, I may find funny, but I won't actually physically laugh. So I can never tell. Monty Python is a perfect example. Monty Python is extremely clever. Funny in places, but I never, ever actually laugh out loud. But I understand that, you know, they're amazing and fabulous and super talented and really clever. Well, well speaking of that kind of thing, and this also goes back a little bit to what you're talking about, um, that lady who wrote that book, and had a bit of research about how women will laugh uh, when they're with their partner. Um, and I found that um, when I'm with a group of people watching a TV program, even if I've watched it before on my own and probably not laughed out loud, but when I watch with a group of people, you know, I laugh out loud with everyone. You know, th there's this strange sort of chemistry that happens with a group of people together while watching something. You know, it wasn't funny when I was watching it on my own. Suddenly now it's funny. Yeah, that's the in-group evolutionary psychology at play right there on the spot. You're all laughing at the same thing. You're all brothers. Yes, indeed. So I often laugh if somebody else is laughing. I mean, somebody may be laughing and you, you have no idea what they're laughing at, but it's just vicariously funny because you feel the need to laugh along. And this, this happens often. But yes, yeah, so I think in isolation, um, people do find different things funny. People have different tastes and comedy is a subjectively funny art form. But when together, I think that homogenizes our general perception of comedy. And I think perhaps that may that may be a reason why stand-up comedy is so popular. Because it is something you do as a group. It's a group venture, typically, when you go and see a stand-up comedian. And, you know, typically in the West, uh, you're fairly fueled up. Uh, and you're in the mood. And you've probably been waiting ages. So... You want the evening to be a success and you're going to find things funnier and perhaps in retrospect, find them less so. I mean, I've, I've had great experiences with um, stand-up comedy and, uh, you know, really genuinely couldn't stop laughing <laughs> the, the entire time, uh, which is fantastic when it happens. Uh, and it does happen. And I think it happens a lot more in a live, during a live performance than watching something on... Uh, on Netflix, for instance. Yes. Um, I mean, that probably brings us on to our next uh, sort of little topic here, which is stand-up comedy. But before we go down that road, and to segue into comedy, uh, stand-up comedy, um, you spoke about cultural variation, but there's also something else that sort of works alongside that. And that is um, the sort of evolution of comedy over, over time. Um, just in the last 30 years, say, when you watch something from 30 years ago, you know, that was hilarious back then. Um, and a lot of things I watch now and think, wow, people laughed at that? Um, so I think there's something to be said for just how comedy changes. And plus also political correctness. Um, that's quite a big deal. It's like in preparation for this show, I was watching um, Eddie Murphy do his Raw stand-up, which is on Netflix. Yes, I've seen it. I thought I'd give that a whirl, um, and I got about 15 minutes in, and it's just, I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, the kind of stuff he says would just end careers now. It's so homophobic, and it's so sexist. I mean, do you remember any of the jokes? Yeah, I, I remember. I remember seeing it uh, immediately after I watched a whole bunch of uh, Richard Pryor stand-up. E equally, if not more, outrageous. Um, but I think it's not It's not just the the, the evolution of comedy comedy doesn't evolve in a vacuum comedy is is led and cultivated by the you know the zeitgeist of the culture at the time so you know it's it's the the the, the place in history that drives cultural tastes which drives comedy comedy is just you know one aspect of a changing culture so when we look at comedy from 30 or 40 years ago 
It is radically different because we're different. We've we've moved on. We've changed and shifted. Things can come around again, but uh, generally speaking, you know, nobody stands still. Everything is evolving along with each other. And certainly I can watch old Steve Martin stand-up routines and still find them funny. Uh, and I can watch Robin Williams stand up and still just cringe all the way through it, um, which, you know, which are 30 years old. Uh, and other other stand up comedians from uh, years ago, like Ben Elton, I, I cannot watch. I, it's not funny at all. And I just just sort of feel a bit sad when I watch their performances, I have to say. Why do you feel sad? Well, I think the I th- comedians are scare me. I'm intimidated by comedians. I feel for them and I think everybody sympathizes with them. Everybody wants them to be successful, not just for for their own enjoyment. You know, I, I don't watch a stand-up comedian just because I want to laugh. I watch a stand well, I do. <laughs> but while I'm there, I'm not only concerned with laughing or not laughing, I'm concerned with that practitioner not going off and killing himself. That's what I'm concerned with. I think these are fragile people who desperately want the spotlight. They want to be successful. They're living the dream. They're going through hell. They torment and hate themselves. And please, God, let them be successful because it'll be it'll be a terrible horror nightmare if they aren't. Wow, where did you get all that from? I, they just, they scare me. I find them scary. I just think, you know, it wouldn't take much to just destroy them. It, they're so, their egos are so fragile that if they're not being funny, they're, they're not anybody. They're nothing. They're worthless. And I think there's a lot of self-loathing and hate. I was listening to a, a, a program on Radio 4 about just this um, many months ago. And it was about how comedians are horrible people. And this was from a comedian. And he was saying, we all hate ourselves and we're horrible. You know, we, <laughs> we're the, the worst people to speak to or to try to get along with because we're just so self-loathing all the time. <laughs> I just thought that's a terrible indictment on behind the scenes comedy but I, I sort of i sort of i think it's because what, what they're doing is so dangerous what they're doing is that they're, they're, you're being told that they're funny you're being told that you're going to laugh that's a hell of a promise and to deliver on that promise you know you just have to have stainless steel balls because but you just said they're fragile who's to say they are <laughs> well that's the queer thing they are you th- you know it does take stainless steel balls to do what they do but in fact, what they're doing is they're taking a risk. They're taking like the ultimate risk and hoping it's going to pay off. So you perceive stainless steel balls, but in fact, they're nervous wrecks who are just praying to God that they're going to succeed. There's often stories where they're throwing up before they come on yeah, the stage. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure those comedians do exist, but I think that's one heck of a generalization. Because I think there's a lot of comedians who um, are tough because they have to be. You know, they have to deal with all the idiots in the crowd. But also, they're there because they have stuff to say. And, and being funny is kind of like a byproduct. It's like there are people who just sort of like, you know, tell stories. Like Bill Hicks on this little list of stand-up comedians here. You know, he's one of them. Bill Maher, he's another one. He, he does stand up, but he will yell at an audience, you know, if, if they laugh at the wrong thing or they're not reacting right or whatever. I can't ever say I I thought Bill Hicks was funny. No, me either. Well, I mean, it's yeah, just l- never funny. L- let's get on to that because you, from what you've just said, just then, you, you you quite like stand up. I personally cannot stand stand up. I find it just horrible and horrible for a number of reasons. The first off is it's one of those situations where all kind of civilization goes out of the window when it comes to the audience. It's like okay, we're at a stand-up, which means we can now behave like absolute animals. And they're just like screaming and just, you know, the worst kind of humans. And this is what I mean about comedians need to be um, fairly thick-skinned because they need to be able to hurl abuse back at the the hecklers. Another reason why I hate stand-up is um, uh, I don't like the fear of being picked on because you know a lot of the shtick that comedians have where they'll start picking on members of the audience if you know they look silly or they think they can riff on someone's face or whatever 
you know, you know, you know, that sort of typical icebreaker thing that comedians do when they come out. <laughs> oh, look at you there! Hey, look at look at that guy. I, I have no issue with that, but I, I I do have a massive anxiety issue with finding a place to sit in a coffee shop. That just kills me. I just, I can't deal with it any longer. I'm never ever going into a coffee shop again because if, you know I just if I, I'm not assured that I'm going if it's not half empty, I'm not going in. Forget it. I can't find a chair. It's over. But sitting in a, a stand-up, you know, right on the front row, right there, you know, wearing a funny hat, uh, fine. Go ahead. Pick on me. Go ahead. Do it. I want you to. That doesn't bother me. I don't share that view. I don't want to be picked on. But I, I think, I mean, I have had fabulous experiences at stand-up shows. Um, I went to see um, somebody who I don't find particularly funny, but when I was there, he actually did make me laugh out loud several times. That was Louis C.K. when he was in the U.K., and uh, he is a very, I mean, I really haven't seen much of his stuff. I don't have much experience with his shtick. But he strikes me as a genuinely smart, you know, really smart, fast thinking chap. He's a comedian who just knows his stuff. You know, he's really rehearsed everything to perfection. And he has a whole bunch of um, segues in his pocket that he can take at any one moment. And he's just super professional. So I think he's the pinnacle of stand-up comedy you know he's somebody who's, who appears to be in, in just in total control uh you know he has the pace right he has the themes right he has the points at where he digresses you know down where a lot of comedians they fumble that but he's he's superb and i think you know if you really want to watch the masters of stand-up i think he at the moment right now is uh the chap to watch just and I'm going purely by, you know, I saw one of his television, I think it was Netflix, one of his stand-up routines, and I saw him live, and uh, he was very impressive. I have absolutely no appetite to follow him or ever see him ever again, um, but I thought when I did, he was spectacularly good. Yeah, he's a big deal here in the United States. Uh, I actually only know him from a part that he played in a sitcom, um, but it seems like everyone is obsessed with Louis C.K. It's like, you know, it's really cool to like him currently, and I, I haven't explored the man. Uh, he doesn't have a funny face. <laughs> he he kind of looks like the kind of guy you want to punch. Um, but, you know, he might be brilliant. And, uh, you know, I'll take what you said on board and give him a look-see. So just going down this list that you've put here of important figures in stand-up history. I put Lenny Bruce on the front of this, um, on the, the front of this list, who a lot of people haven't heard of. But I put him in here because he's very high, very highly regarded by comedians as being like the first person or the first comedian to actually sort of break the tradition of just coming on and telling jokes. He like, he comes on and tells stories, you know, and just sort of like you know meanders and um, he's a raconteur. Yeah, but um, he just sort of talks about what's on his mind and all of this kind of thing. It's not necessarily funny. <laughs> And this is what I mean about... It sounds like Ronnie Corbett. He used to do that and he was never funny. No, it's no because this guy was definitely a little bit more um, sort of political. I mean, he died like a heroin overdose, I think. He's one of those crazy guys, you know, one of those kind of artists. I think Ronnie Corbett's still alive. He's in his 80s, deep into his 80s. Yes, yeah, I, I've not heard of his demise. Um, anyway, so uh, Bill Cosby, is apparently he was another very influential guy. But now he's not funny at all. And actually, retrospectively, he's not funny at all because of um, recent revelations. <laughs> I never actually saw any of his stand-up. I only know him from The Cosby Show, right? Uh, which was terrible. And it was terrible at the time. I, I hated it. I saw it a couple of times. You hated because, it because you're a racist. Um, I saw it a couple of times. And I just I kept not understanding the family dynamic and who was who. And that kind of bothered me a little bit. And that combined with the fact that I didn't find it very funny, I, I sort of didn't really watch. Um, and there are funnier things on television at the time. But I don't really get Bill Cosby. I have no references for him at all. I just He doesn't, doesn't figure on my uh, memory landscape at all. Yeah, I've certainly not I've tracked down any of his uh, stand-up routines, but apparently it was really good. And he's uh, got some very well-known sketches. Um, yeah, and Eddie Murphy, as we've spoken about, it's like, holy cow, <laughs> the kind of stuff that he said, the kind of stuff that he would say. And also, when you talk about the zeitgeist, it's like the audience, you know, this is this, you know, middle class audience, huge audience in New York City at the uh, the raw recording. 
And they're just like cheering along to when he's talking about faggots and all of this other stuff. It's just, it's so surreal to sort of uh, watch that, you know. And it's that's only, it, I think it's thirty years ago that that gig. Yeah, but if somebody's talking about things that are, you know, uh, not politically correct or taboo or whatever it is, comedy can can sort of penetrate those reservations in your mind and still be funny. You know, you can that that's one of the great strengths of comedy is that you can laugh at something that is inherently not funny. I mean, it's a subject matter that is terrifying. But comedy can help you get through it, get over it, think of it in different ways, and even get, you know, seriously dark laughs out of it. I mean, you know, it's the human condition is pretty terminal. Uh, and I think uh, a great strength of comedy is that it's a tool that can be used, as you said in your introduction, to help us heal over traumatic events and, you know, the terrible realities of living on the planet. And Eddie Murphy, you know, he can he can um, comedically chastise homosexuality on stage, and people can laugh along. Even and they can even they can be gay, you know. They they they, they understand the social stereotypes, but it, you know, it doesn't stop something being funny. No, the reason why I bring it up is just that in the mainstream, comedy just doesn't work like that anymore. Comedy isn't so hateful. Now that doesn't mean it's not funny. It just means that's not the way it is now. Because we're having our freedom of speech shut down. Well, ah, well, I mean, th that's another conversation. But I think it's it's not just that. It's like we're just more compassionate. I mean, we still laugh and we still go and see stand-up comedians. But it's like the style of humor is just a lot less hateful. Because Eddie Murphy's talk was... A lot of it did seem pretty hateful towards women and, and homosexuals and various other groups. Um, obviously, he gets a certain pass because he... And everybody he talked about. And everybody what? <laughs> And everybody he talked about. <laughs> You're listing the groups that uh, his hate speech uh, centered upon. It was pretty much everything he talked about. was uh, That was his style. But but we give someone like Eddie Murphy a pass by default anyway because he's not a white man. So he has a certain amount of leverage. But even so, I think comedy just uh, in terms of the direction it's going down is just, it's not becoming um, like, you know, benign and just anodyne to the point of just irrelevancy. You know, it's still hard hitting and biting and, and you know, walks a fine line, but it's not so hateful now. It's like we seem to have more compassion. No, 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 about no, no. We certain still have groups. characters who are fairly hateful. Roy Chubby Brown, Frankie Boyle. They are not mainstream. Yeah. It's like Roy Chubby right? Brown is not on TV. Um, Frankie Boyle is. Which one's Frankie Boyle? He's that really controversial comedian who's pretty seriously hardcore uh, on what i have to say w what kind of stuff is he hardcore on yeah, god all kinds of horrendous terrible awful topics that i really wouldn't want to plumb for comedic value no no but that i really what, what can't like? even list here because i'm so <laughs> no because it, it, it's my contention that that if you're hateful towards certain groups it could be detrimental to your career yeah yeah exactly that yeah i think so i think so i think so for example jim davidson you know there's no way that he could get away with the kind of things that he used to say. And I think the reason why he's not on his screens, it's because we've sort of grown out of his racist jokes. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. I think characters and, and comedians like him uh, are not in the mainstream. They are still around and their comedy can still be sought. Uh, but certainly they're not in the mainstream. I completely agree. But, have, but, but I mean, hateful is different from just being an arsehole because I think arsehole comedy is is pretty popular. It's like on this list you got here, Ricky Gervais. Now, a lot of his stand-up that I've seen, you know, he just comes across as just a horrible, obnoxious guy. I don't think he is in real life. You know, it's just a character that he's doing. But I think he, he gets away with it because it's satire. You know, he can say these things because it's okay. It's okay. Yes, he's it's made like saying these, allegedly in front yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. It's you know he said these horrible things about you know X, Y, and Z people, but uh, it's satire, and you're laughing at people who make jokes like that. You know, like also yeah, you're not the, laughing. Um, you're not laughing at and giving me the money, <laughs> for instance. Yeah, it's like um, the pub landlord guy and Al Alf Garnet, for example, who died. Um, couple of days ago last week i think coincided with the paris attacks not related um he uh he he started that whole thing you know where he would be this you know loud mouth bigot and people would see him in the street and th think that he was that person and say yeah good on you mate send them all back and all this kind of thing <laughs> anyway yeah i mean he was actually he was actually a double agent yes because he really was 
It really was like that. Yeah, he's actually Jewish. Anyway, mm. and you've already mentioned Bill uh, Ben Elton, who I can't stand. Again, Ben Elton strikes me as um, just the worst kind of <laughs> leftist political, um, boring comedian. Never, never, never thought he was funny. I mean, I got where he was coming from, and he was convincingly clever. Um, but having read a couple of his books as well, uh, good grief! I just really you read some of his books. Yes, well, I don't know. You know, someone recommended them many, many, many millions of years ago, and I read a couple. Um, yeah, just awful. Just not my scene at all, and uh, really makes me think. You know, perhaps stand-up comedy is just not for me. So I'm always very hesitant. But when I, but I, but I'm always. You said you really like stand-up comedy. I do, I do. So I'm. You al- mean stand-up comedy is not for you, as in performing? Uh, no, I, I said. That when I see performers like Ben Elton, I think perhaps stand-up comedy is not for me. But when I actually do see stand-up comedy, you know, I can when it, when it's good, it's great, really fantastic. It's really superb medium for comedy. I think uh, when it's done well, and it's great, and you feel great, and you know, when you're walking away, and it was a total success for everyone all around. You sort of cheer in your mind for everybody, not just you, but also the performers, and no one got hurt. And it was, it's a wonderful thing. But as I say, I think it's very, um, it's dangerous, dangerously explosive comedy. Because if it goes bad, boy, oh boy, that's <laughs> tolerable. You know, the whole toe curling thing is difficult for me. And I think it is for everyone. A lot of people find that appealing. But a lot of comedy is quite toe curling. And I just, I can't stand it. And the most toe curling comedy is female stand-up comedians. Now, they all seem to be really crude really 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 crude in a way that the male comedians seem not to be this could be completely subjective but i just i i my toes are curling when i'm hearing them and i think oh god she's dying oh my god i need to just walk away and it's it's a horrible disaster and i I tried to think of mainstream female comedians and um i sort of struggled there i don't i don't really i can't really think of that many Uh, the only one i think who's vaguely funny and also quite attractive is tina fey i think she's quite clearly very talented and quite funny and pretty good and the only other female stand-up comedian i can think of was sarah milliken who i think is pretty funny um she was once asked why how why she got into comedy and she said um people were laughing at me anyway i thought i'd try and make some money out of it (laughs) which i thought was quite funny but people like Joe Brand, right. oh God. Well, they have their fans. Just not, just not funny. Of course, they have their fans. Of course, lots of people find these people funny. You know, it is subjective, and uh, you know, who is that British comedian who's just who just started becoming really miserable, and that became a thing, and now his comedy is just he's a misery. He's quite successful. He's quite successful. He does a lot of, um, he's an impresario quite often these days. Jack D. Jack D, yes. So, you know, I quite like his approach where he's just miserable right from the start and just, <laughs> but is funny for it. But I think it takes a lot of talent. It just, it takes, it takes talented people to be genuinely funny. Yeah. Um, going back to the um, women comedians, uh, you mean Tina Fey is like a stand up comedian? She did stand up com- comedy, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I quite like some of her shows. Um, there's, uh, there are funny comedians. I'm looking at the list here, and um, yeah, I mean, I don't find any of these people funny, but but there there have been female funny people. But one of there's um there's a woman called Laura Solon. Have you heard of her? Sounds familiar. She's on Radio Four. She has a Radio Four comedy show, or she had. And I discovered that the BBC, in typical BBC fashion, actually have a a quota that they needed to fill. Um, they needed to make sure they had X amount of, you know, each group and X amount of female comedians. And this Laura Solon had her comedy um, show commissioned by the BBC Radio 4. And it's worth listening to. Actually, I meant to, um, I, I, I forgot, but I meant to actually try and get a couple of clips together uh, for this program because it's so unfunny. It's really, really, really remarkably unfunny. What is the program called? It's it's like a sketch show. It's called the Laura Solon Show. I think it's her name. But it's just remarkably unfunny. Um, I'm surely anyone who listens to it will think, how the hell did this get on the radio? Is, is, there, is there any objectivity whatsoever at all in any shape or form for, for comedy? 
I mean, you know, if, if you need, if you need, if you have, let's say you are a commissioning program director and you have five comedians from which you need to choose two, one needs to be a man, one needs to be a woman. How do you ascertain whether or not they're funny? Do you just simply have to have the tastes of the common man or are you using some sort of metric? What? Is there any objectivity? Well, I think, you know, com comedians will be types of comedians. You'll have comedians who are kind of deadpan or comedians who are this, that, and the other. Um, and so that might be part of the parameters that you want a deadpan comedian for this slot. I don't know. I have Time no idea. slot. But also, it's like everything else. You know, what kind of agent they have, what kind of uh, noises are being made about them. And, you know, there are people who are supposed to be, like, unbelievably over-the-top funny who I simply cannot stand. And this is what I said at the top of the show about how subjective it all is. Like, for example, um, that idiot. What's his name? Oh, what the hell is his name? Yeah, you're going to narrow it down a bit. No. Um, Brand. Russell Brand? He is just completely insufferable. I cannot stand to hear his... Is he a comedian? Yeah, he's a stand-up comedian. Yeah. Why did you say that? Are you being facetious? I mean, you have to be being no. facetious. You don't know he's a comedian. No, I thought he was some sort of um, activist, some kind of polemicist of some description. Oh, oh he's always because doing he's that. Yeah, banging yeah. on about no, the government. He, and but he's doing a bono, basically. He's kind of using his yeah, right. power and influence to uh, try and um, make changes. You know, fair enough, whatever. Anyway. Um, and also, uh, so there's people like Drussel Brand and also who we've already mentioned. Um, Simon Pegg, who for some reason the world unanimously thinks that he is just this amazing funny guy, when to me he's not funny at all, and he's just over the top overrated. Well, I haven't seen any of his stand-up, if he's done stand-up. I assume he has. I think he has, in fact, Simon Pegg. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen very much of his output at all, nor have I heard very much about him. Um, but you, but but you know he's a genius. His films. No, I've seen a couple of his films, and I enjoyed them. I liked... Um, Shaun of the Dead, we've spoken about this, and uh, something or other he did, which I thought was quite good, Spaced. But uh, that's all I know about him. I haven't heard anything, any any, any of uh, singing endorsements for him. That's oh, it's freaking all over the place. It's all I ever hear. Hmm. This could be a, a an Atlantic divide. Similarly, I haven't heard anything about, and we don't hear anything about, uh, Ellen DeGeneres over here. But apparently she is the second deity to the right of Oprah Winfrey in the United States. Right. Yeah, she's got a kind of talk show. Uh, I see her face on billboards and things like that. Mm. But I, I generally don't run into her. I actually watched um, the last series of Ellen as a kind of sort of science experiment. So I heard so much chatter about how downhill it went after she sort of came out of the closet and the show stopped being funny. <laughs> This was like in the late 90s or something. So I actually sort of um, watched uh, most of the episodes of the last series of uh, Ellen. And this actually wasn't too bad. <laughs> I didn't think it was that unfunny at all. Did it follow the standard formula for comedy in American programming? You know, you always have five characters and... I mean, they, se they seem so samey. Uh, the, the really popular shows at the moment are The Big Bang Theory. Well, I mean, they're sitcoms uh, and they're set in an apartment. And, and you know all the 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 protagonists all live in the same apartment building, and you know they walk across the hall from each other, and you know, they spend most of the time just uh, the you know just expositing these brilliantly observational soliloquies, you know, without making any mistakes or anything. Just absolutely the incredible amount of wit that is coming out of these individuals clearly comes from a committee of writers, uh, all 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 springing from uh, what's his name. Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, he's pretty much, you know, started off the whole genre. And now they're just everywhere you point. All comedy on TV is exactly the same formula. It's scary. Apart from the sitcom that I uh, mentioned. And they can be funny, which is scary. <laughs> apart because from they have the, a committee of writers. Apart from the comedy that I mentioned at the opening of the show, the uh, which you have to watch, the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, because it's totally not that. Oh, it's weird how it's it's a funny comedy and it's just everything that you described it isn't oh, and it's good. kind of like a reaction against all of that it's uh it's it's really good every character in there is completely hateable mm -hmm. but yet for some reason it really works anyway so it's things like that the fact that shows like that exist that make me think that everything isn't a lost cause that 
there are still some some good programs out there. No, oh, I think so. There's a there's there's more talent than there ever was out there. It's just that there's more content by a scale of magnitude than there ever was. So to find the gold, you just have to work a little bit harder. But it's out there. I mean, you know, I'm very impressed by. And there's 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 lots of um, directions comedy can come from these days. And one of the biggest directions, of course, is the internet. You know, the internet is responsible for an awful lot of comedy. I think you know a lot of ideas come from the internet. Uh, which a lot of television programs shamefully steal. And, uh, you know, it's a sort of distributed, collaborative effort, you know, a decentralized generation of comedy, which I think the internet is really great for. I'm thinking in particular of Reddit, that front page of the internet, which generates an awful lot of comedy. And recently um, there was a music video by Drake, a quiet, decent, nice, honest polite Canadian rapper uh, who released a uh, music video where he just sort of dad dances all the way through it. And, and uh, you know, Reddit video editors just went to town on that video. And there are a million varieties of him, of Drake dancing in this ridiculous little dance moves, completely inoffensive dance moves uh, that have been overlaid with various graphics accoutrements uh on reddit that is hilarious so i think the internet can be quite funny <laughs> and i think that's a new a whole new um niche of of comedy available to us now well like so many other things the internet has made um funny people um get their work out there you know it's like you, before the internet came along if you're a funny person you know you were funny down the pub and, and that that was it you know, unless you aspire to be sort of on the TV or <laughs> you get your work in print or whatever. But now, because of the internet, you know, people can just be funny and just get their stuff out there and normal people can receive it and laugh if they want to. Which I think is great, especially if the costs are low. Because if the costs are low and it's a medium to which everyone has access, then, you know, there's a meritocracy in action. And hopefully the talent floats to the top. So, you know... When I browse through the funny images in Reddit, I'm, I'm getting the one the images that are voted highest, <laughs> and they're and they're very often very funny. That's so flawed though, because it's like the the ones that people see keep getting voted up, and the ones that people don't see, you know, people don't see them to find to, to see whether or not they're funny to vote them up. So just on the top it gets so stagnant because it's all the same old crap. Yeah, I suppose there's a sort of a, a scrobbling uh, effect that occurs. Uh, to take a last FM reference. Yes. But uh, yeah, I guess I suppose, I mean, I've certainly, I think I see the homogenization of comedy and that uh, I see the sort of patterns and formulae that comedy writers use being conducted from country to country. So I see that this country now is is on a par comedy-wise with America in terms of tastes. You know, we have very little here that, wouldn't be something you could immediately translate to an American audience. Change a few word pronunciations here and there, and it's exactly the same model, mm. uh, which I think is not particularly a good thing. I mean, I'm thinking of um, Faulty Towers, which at the time was a major departure for the comedy that was current, you know, current in America. It was a very British comedy when it came out, but now new British comedies that come out are not that far away from uh, new comedy that's coming out in the United States. So. We are. We have become an annex. Well, I used to be a comedy snob, not to the point of the comedy snob I described early in the um the show, but to the point where I just assumed that British comedy would be better than American comedy. American comedy is just bland and crap, and British comedy is just so finely crafted and just a sense of humor is so wonderfully nuanced and all this other stuff. But I've since discovered that that's actually crap. The all my favorite shows tend to be American shows. And I think it's just to do with um, the volume of shows. It's the fact that they, they make so many of them. It's like you talk about Faulty Towers just there, but there's only two series of Faulty Towers. That's it. People often talk about the... That doesn't mean it's not funny. Yes. But people... But that's... Okay. But people often talk about The Office as well in the same breath as Faulty Towers. And again, it's just like you're talking about like two series. <laughs> Whereas, like, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, for example. You know, each season has at least sort of 10 episodes in it or something like that. Um, 
and they're consistent. Yes, I they are they are uh, they certainly are consistent. And I'm sure we've spoken about this before, but we certainly seem to be in a golden age for sitcoms because there are millions of them and even over the course of five or six seasons they remain consistently funny and uh which is incredible but i think it's to do with the fact that they have a high churn rate of writers and if they don't they have writers they have committees right so when you have you know massive effort going into making a comedy vehicle funny well just by sheer dint of effort um by the gods you can make it funny or at least funny enough so there's a lot of episodes out a lot of um television programs sitcoms out there that are funny enough they're entertaining enough there's enough in them to keep you interested they're not you know nothing can be killer funny all the time nothing nobody no program it's just impossible and this goes back to the sense of nervousness that i always get from comedians uh, they know they can't be funny forever. They know they can't keep up their hit rate, and they know that they've sh- they've spent their gold right at the very beginning of their careers. Uh, you know, you you have one season of shows in you. That's it. After that, you're done. You're spent. You better have more people you could lean on who understand your style, because if not, then you disappear into the ether. Right. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think people mat- mature. I don't think it's necessarily true, but I think it is. It's a fact. I think, yeah, you know, you're funny for a while and not forever. Mm. Yes. So, radio and TV we have here. So, you've written the one show, but do you mean the now show? The now show, yes. That is on a television, that's a, a, a fairly leftist sketch show. Sketch show? Maybe not a sketch uh... show so much, but it's sort of... It's sort of a live recording topical, of a topical, topical news, news comedy program satirical. on Radio 4. Satirical. Yeah, satirical program Radio 4. Yeah, um, it's not funny at all. Yeah, it's not too funny, I have to say. Uh, but then I don't think anything's funny on Radio 4. There's only Claire in the community, which I found passingly humorous. But apart right. from that, it's all fairly terrible. Uh, but radio, I mean, I don't know about any other radio stations, to be honest, but there are a few comedy podcasts out there which can be quite good. Uh, I can't think of anything at the moment, but uh, I think that's a wonderful medium for comedy. I think podcasts is great because, it, again, it's it's accessible to anyone. So if you really do think you have something that'll make people laugh, or at least yourselves, uh, you can put it out there and uh, see what happens. So I, th- I think there will be great comedy coming out of the podcast averse um, soon. And I, I gather there are already comedy programs, but I, I haven't investigated them, but I'll make an effort to. Yeah, but the whole podcast format is totally flawed, um, which we discussed on the uh, on the podcast episode that we did. But yeah, going back to Radio 4, yeah, I, I think Radio 4 comedy is all uh, is all pretty bad. Again, it's that whole subjective thing. But the, the Now show in particular um, is that, again, this word that's been coined recently it's very regressive leftist um and it's very smug and it's very um self-righteous well that's the bbc all round yeah it is that's that's their virtual mandate yes indeed but yeah uh, i agree with you that the comedy on the radio 4 has always been uh pretty it's not has always been pretty. except for claire in the community which was genuinely funny i never found that funny at all i found it really boring oh and and it was uh, you know the it was a female. So. Yes. Oh, Sally Phillips. That's double who, gold. Claire. That's Claire. Yeah. But yeah, no, I never liked that. But there's um, Ed Reardon's week, which I quite like. This very sort of droll, uh, curmudgeon. A couple of other things which were kind of okay on Radio Four, but generally speaking, comedy and drama were all pretty bad on that. On TV, I've always liked. Uh, no, we can't talk about that. We've already done TV, films, lots of genuinely funny films. Uh, I just tried off the top of my head to think of a few films that I did find funny, laugh out loud funny. And I thought of a couple of Will Ferrell films. I think he is quite funny. Um, He did a fairly recent one about dinosaurs. I've forgotten the title now. It's only just popped into my head now, Will Ferrell. But his dinosaur movie and his ice skating movie um, I thought were very funny indeed. Uh, He plays around with taboos and... um, 
it's a great effect. I think he's a very funny man. And Ben Stiller, even though Ben Stiller is everywhere and in every movie, I still think he's able to produce funny films. And perhaps this is from his influence by his friend Ricky Gervais. I think they work quite well together. And I believe he is influenced by Gervaisian humor and mer- Merchantian humor. I enjoyed Zoolander. And I think everybody enjoyed Zoolander. And Tropic Thunder, I thought, was particularly funny. Not least because your favorite comedian was blown up in it. Uh, I don't think Ben Stiller is everywhere these days. I mean, there was a time when Ben Stiller was just all over the place. But I think that's kind of cooled off now. And yeah, he's, he's not still lurking this... in the shadows in all Yeah, he films. is, but he's not quite that bankable star that he once was. Um, yeah, Zoolander was kind of okay. Tropic Thunder was kind of patchy. I think Will Ferrell as well. His films are generally kind of patchy. I, th- I think there's something about the film format, uh, which I think is problematic for kind of silly comedies. I think they're just too long. Yeah, it's never going to be 90 minutes absolutely packed full of gags. It's impossible. I mean, I think Airplane gets close to that sort of thing, but uh, I haven't seen anything like Airplane since. And you can discount all of those Dwayne and Wayne films, the uh, scary movie and disaster movie and all the rest of the ones that these two brothers write. They're diabolically bad. Yeah. Wyans brothers, are they? Lowest common denominator film. And again, that's another sort of example of just how subjective comedy is. Yeah, exactly. Totally subjective. Because I personally don't find them funny. Those seriously crappy films, you know, have their audience. Yes. <laughs> and uh, they're seriously bad. But the, I can't remember the last funny film I watched. Um, but yeah, as I say, I've, I, I prefer the, the TV show format of, you know, less than half hour. That, that's enough to sort of keep my interests. Yeah, time is definitely a factor. I think shorter is better. And when you simply have to fill a stadium or fill a stage show, with a certain amount of comedy already that constraint pressures you with unfunniness uh it's difficult i don't think that's how comedy naturally works it just being funny doesn't have any kind of definable time limit (laughs) and typically it's shorter than it is longer so i agree that films are the wrong sort of medium for really successful comedy and to, so there's a very small number of success stories, uh, but they are out there. I mean, I thought Borat was, uh, I mean, you say patchy and, you know, it was patchy. All of them are patchy. All the films are patchy, but there's still good laughs in it and it's worth watching and you would recommend it. Uh, Blading, Blazing Saddles never made me laugh out loud, but it was funny nonetheless. <laughs> I would, I would recommend it. Yeah, Borat's a bit of a funny one because it's... Um... I think it's a style of comedy, which is kind of like on the wane now, which is um, kind of like daredevil comedy, you know, like jackass and all of that yeah, kind he's, of stuff. He's literally putting his life on the line for comedy. Yeah. And um, or just annoying people, you know, which I think is a, is a kind of jackass thing. Like, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, but comedy at other people's expense is often the funniest comedy. Yeah, and something that we touched on earlier, which I kind of want to touch on again, because we've not mentioned um, uh, hate humor. It's like one of my sort of least favorable sort of styles of humor is just insults. And it's like you like the show South Park, you know, which kind of has its moments in it. But a lot of its comedy is just really these two guys, Matt and Trey, just being bullies. And just they have so much power that they're able just to like be sort of name calling to all the other celebrities that they don't like. Yes, which <laughs> and is it's hilarious. Like, yeah, which is hilarious to most people. But for me, I just find that just so sort of tedious. It's like it's very unsophisticated. It's like, you know, you, you can be funny without just calling people names all the time. I think I think the celebrities featured in Team America all thought it was hilarious. Especially Matt Damon, who just thought it was an absolute scream. Genuinely thought it was absolutely brilliant. Right. Yeah, I'm more talking about South Park. Which is, um, South Park is kind of a different beast because um, because it can be made very quickly, the episodes. And so they tend to uh, they tend to be topical. And so, you know, whatever's happened in that week, that they can quickly cobble together a show which kind of makes fun of it um, and stuff like that. I think comedians comedians strike me, especially those two, to be, and perhaps necessarily so, workaholics. They appear to be complete workaholics to me. Oh, for sure. Oh, I I think everyone that's sort of, you know, 
successful. I think they're well, successful. Well, not even for, successful. For, I think all of them just are. They just inherently must be. Mm-mm. I don't think so. But the successful ones, I think, are workaholics because well, they I have think that's true. That's true of anything. To be successful in anything, I think you need to be a workaholic these days. The competition is so fierce and so uh, ubiquitous. I think perhaps we've missed out quite a bit, and we'll have to revisit this uh, topic. But unless there's anything more from you, I will simply remind listeners that they have been listening to Eclecticist, uh, the podcast. We have a supporting webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. It has details on all of our previous shows, uh, upcoming topics, and there's a contact form at the bottom if you'd like to fill that out and give us some suggestions, some ideas for topics, some comments, some criticisms, and some more information that we can put on our notes. Because we do like to have you know, some fairly comprehensive notes for each of our shows, uh, which are available on our website. Our outro music of choice this time around is, again, something open source so we don't get sued. And it is entitled Subliminal Pestilence by Daniel Bautista. This is from Opsound. It's uh, Creative Commons. And the reason why I've included this bit of music is because I find this particular type of music funny. It just makes me laugh. I think of all that big hair and all the makeup on the guys, and it's just, it's incredibly silly, and I find it quite amusing. But uh, have a listen. It's quality music, and we will see you next time. We haven't determined what our next topic will be but when we know we'll put it on our website thank you very much and good evening